Good afternoon, everyone. Hope this is going out. Hope everyone can see me. Um, welcome to the ALA webinar for what is the month we're in now, September. Um, late in the year already. I'm glad you could join us. Um, yeah, we're, we're dialing in now from, from all over the country. I'm personally in uh, Canberra. Before we go any further, I'd like to acknowledge that Canberra is, of course, an unwall country. Um, I'd like to pay my respects to the elders of the unwall people, both past, present, and emerging. But we have speakers today from all across the country, and I'll introduce them in a moment. Um, but what we're here to talk about today uh, is, is animal movement, which is, of course, a fascinating topic of conversation and one we could spend many hours talking about. Um, what's interesting to, to me as someone who, who's been interested in, in landscape ecology and now working at, at uh, the Atlas is that um, often, despite being big fans of, of animals and, and all aspects of their ecology, movement is actually a strange thing for us because it's almost a problem. Uh, if, if we're interested in, in, in what I'd call place-based conservation, say the animals that live in a national park, then movement is, is, is a challenge because what if uh, an animal was in the place you're at yesterday and not today? What if it is migratory and will be there in summer but you're there in winter? What if a species lived somewhere hundreds or thousands of years ago and no longer does. In these ways, uh, movement uh, becomes still a fascinating aspect, but also a challenging one. And today we have three speakers from all around the country who are here to tell us their insights on, on various aspects of that problem and from a range of scales, uh, starting with uh, Holly Kirk from RMIT. Just wave, Holly. And uh, lovely, thank you. And Ross Crates from ANU. And Julia Ryland, who's a consultant with Ecological Australia and with the University of Western Sydney. Hi, Julia. Um, we've got uh, a lot to get through today, so I'm not going to talk for too much longer. Uh, just a few uh, admin points. Um, the uh, way in which you're viewing this webinar should have, a few, have some um, tabs around it. Uh, if you have, uh, there's a Q&A section with a little question mark, so feel free to enter, um, to enter questions there. There's a chat function, feel free to drop in there and say, hello and where you're um, calling in from. Always nice to know the audience. We're also doing a little bit of a poll, so uh, there should be a little bar chart uh, symbol in there somewhere. Um, there'll be some questions down, some at the end. Uh, if you feel like uh, giving us some information about yourselves, we'd love to hear where you're calling in from. Uh, I think that's enough from me for now. Though. Without further ado, I'd like to hand over to Holly, who's gonna talk about her research. Thank you, Holly. Thank you, Martin. Uh, the standard, let me share my screen, um, preface to all talks these days. Great, I think that's working. Okay, so thank you for having me. Um, I'm Holly Kirk. I am a uh, postdoc at RMIT University, and I work in the interdisciplinary conservation science group. Icon Science. And before I begin, um, firstly, I would like to acknowledge that I'm coming to you today from Wajuk Noongar country, so over in Perth, WA. Um, but I'd also like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which the work I'm talking about today takes place, who are the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nations, and I pay my respects to their elders, past, present, and emerging. I'd also like to flag that um, the work I'm talking about has been supported um, variously currently by the Ian Potter Foundation, but also GHD, the Nest Call Hub, and has been developed in collaboration with the City of Melbourne. So, cities. Why should we care about urban biodiversity, biodiversity in cities? Cities are growing and increasing in size and concentration. Um, they're also growing on areas that often have naturally very high levels of biodiversity, places like wetlands and coastlines. Um, not only does this make cities an obvious place to focus our conservation efforts, but cities are also home to a very large number of threatened species. 30% um, I think of Australian threatened species actually occur in cities. So cities can be hotspots for biodiversity and should be considered somewhere to do conservation in their own right. However, <laughs> doing biodiversity conservation in cities can be a little bit depressing. It's very complicated. Um, there are lots of different actors. There's a lot of pressure being put on nature in our cities. 
Um, fortunately, lots of other urban professionals also think that um, thinking about urban development right now in, in our cities or on our edge of our cities particularly is also depressing. Um, now, these are the words that we asked people to use in a recent workshop we had with people like um, local government workers, urban planners, developers, um, landscape architects. And as you can see, um, yes, they, they also find working in the urban space at the moment, sometimes a little bit depressing, destructive, boring. The word Mordor is even in there. And that's actually possibly the word I would use to describe places like this, um, where really we're creating these urban developments that really are quite inhospitable, uh, inhospitable for both people and for nature. The really good news is that lots of people working in urban development actually recognize the value of nature in our cities and in our urban spaces. Um, and here we asked, um, again, the same kinds of groups of urban professionals to describe what nature meant to them during the COVID lockdowns in Melbourne. These were professionals within Victoria. Um, and as you can see there, connection, escape, hope, peace, relaxation, grounding, these are the kinds of things that people get from cities too. So why should we care about urban biodiversity? Well, it's also vital for human, human well-being. Um, these are all the kinds of things that we get from um, having beautiful, biodiverse green spaces and green streets within our cities. And it's worth noting that um, some of these benefits are actually to do with biodiversity, not just to do with urban greening itself. So it's not just about putting in any old grass or trees. It's also about thinking carefully about the kind of native species and the wildlife that goes alongside that. Um, also, enabling access to everyday nature allows people to engage with that nature, helping to foster positive connections with the natural world. So how do we achieve this vision of healthy, thriving urban ecosystems? Um, planning for biodiversity in cities is hard, space and money are at a premium, and we have to try and prioritise places, unfortunately, where we can have the most impact for nature. And so that's where an animal movement comes in. So our wildlife needs to move around cities for the same reason people do, um, to find food, to find friends, to find places to rest. Um, but imagine moving across this urban matrix. Um, the habitat that exists within the urban matrix is becoming smaller and smaller and more fragmented. Um, and so how can we think strategically about where we put new habitat or enhance existing habitat for our urban nature? Um, and this is where I come in. So I've been really interested in the last few years in using ecological connectivity theory to assess different urban design solutions. So what is ecological connectivity? Well, just very briefly, it's essentially a way of measuring or quantifying the level of fragmentation within a landscape, or the degree to which the landscape impedes movement. Why is it useful in an urban context? Well, um, so ecological connectivity has been used quite a lot um, in the sort of wider landscape level planning for conservation, but I think it has a value, has a role to play in an urban context. It's actually relatively simple for people to understand. Um, same kind of concepts of um, animals needing to move for the same reason people do. Also, we can think about um, connecting people up with um, active transport corridors, and those can also be corridors for wildlife. Um, urban Ecological connectivity can operate at a range of different scales, and we're already seeing it being used in urban planning um, across a variety of different government areas, and for example, internationally with the City Biodiversity Index. So I've been very privileged for the last few years to work quite closely with the City of Melbourne to develop a framework um, for them to measure their urban connectivity and use that as a way for planning different solutions um, and um, solutions for sustainability in nature within their city. Um, and the method that we've been choosing to develop with them specifically breaks down the urban habitat into uh, 
essentially resources for wildlife, so habitat patches, that those might be um, parks or um, corridors, creek lines, um, and also barriers within the landscape, so things that stop animals from moving. So when we're thinking about looking at um, ecological connectivity, we often think about it from the perspective of a group of animals. Um, and for example, the work that we've been doing, we actually chose seven different animal groups. Um, we looked at, here's just a few of them, and the kinds of considerations that um, we might take. And the reason we look at different animal groups is, as you can see here, um, the way that a aquatic invertebrate moves around the landscape and the resources that it needs is quite different to the way perhaps this beautiful red rump parrot um, would be moving around the landscape. So they can, there are different movement distances to consider, um, there are different resources and different potential barriers to movement that each species um, needs or must be taken account, into account when planning for these species in the urban landscape. So we use a method of quantifying ecological connectivity called effective mesh size. This was um, developed by Jaeger uh, quite a few years ago now. Um, if you'd like to learn more about the maths behind it, please head to Spanowitz and Jaeger 2019. It's a great recent paper. Um, but essentially, effective mesh size is a measure of area and the probability of connectedness. So how, how connected the landscape is for um, different animal species. And we originally have used this method because, um, first of all, it works really well with the kinds of spatial data that local governments have to hand, but it's also um, you can also implement it in just sort of regular GIS software like ArcGIS. However, I developed a reproducible workflow in R specifically so that we could allow um, or do repeatable calculations to test different urban planning scenarios. Um, and so what are those some of the scenarios we've been looking at? Well, in the city of Melbourne, a large portion of the land that they're able to use for capital works uh, are along roads. And roads are often um, a main kind of considered to be a, a significant barrier to movement. So we asked, well, what would happen if incrementally remo we removed every single road segment from the habit from the landscape within the city of Melbourne? And when I say remove, I mean we kind of said what would happen if we mitigated that road barrier effect either by slowing down traffic, maybe closing the road completely, or by um, introducing really great roadside vegetation. And this allowed us to produce this hierarchy of different road segments within the landscape. Um, so we could look at which areas, which roads were potentially going to be top targets for doing biodiversity actions. And like I said before, we targeted this analysis at um, seven different animal groups, covering off a lot of different movement capabilities and also the kinds of resources those animals need. Um, another planning scenario we've tested this method on, um, I have a great colleague, Tommy Cruiser, who's an urban planner, and he is really passionate about converting parking spaces to parklets and in general just kind of what what it would be like if we could actually reduce traffic and get cars off the road in our cities um, and so he tested a bunch of or looked at a bunch of different um, scenarios for removing parking spaces and actually converting them into parks and so again the same thing I applied the connectivity measure this time to just two two species um, that occur in the city of Melbourne, New Holland honey eater and blue banded bee. Um, and I asked what happens when we convert those parking spaces to parks. And you can see here that um, this purple color denotes the kind of connected habitat patches. And um, one of the things we found was that um, under certain scenarios, um, the parking space conversion actually could have the potential to connect up some of the really big parks in the city of Melbourne. So what now? Well, I'm actually very lucky to be working on a great project um, funded by the Ian Potter Foundation, where we are attempting to mainstream a method for incorporating biodiversity into the urban design frame, um, process. That's called BSUD. You can read more about that in a recent paper. There's a link to it at the end of this talk. Um, and one of the things I'm really keen to do is to start incorporating the connectivity model that we're using into that piece of work in our assessment phase um, and potentially combining that with population viability analysis. The connectivity framework is also being applied in other places, the city of Knox and hopefully maybe even the ACT 
more on that eventually, maybe soon. Um, and finally, I'm really excited to tell you about a project back in the city of Melbourne again, um, the Superb City Rens project, where we're actually trying to test some of those assumptions about whether or not putting in targeted vegetation, this is for small woodland birds like the superb fairy wren, whether that's actually going to see an increase in um, woodland birds moving around the city, hopefully outside of the sort of um, bastion at the moment of Royal Park where there's um, a really high level of bird biodiversity. So um, you can learn more about the superb city wrens project by popping that into Facebook. We have a excitingly busy Facebook group of people currently putting in their um, sightings of superb fairy wrens. It's actually expanded beyond Melbourne because people just really love superb fairy wrens. Um, so please, um, if you feel like some uplifting moments, head over there because everyone is going absolutely mad for fairy wrens um, across Australia. Um, that just leaves me to thank my amazing co-authors um, on all these projects and also pop a couple a couple of links in there they're not very helpful because these slides are going to disappear um but you can find out a bit more also our reproducible workflow in r is available on github for people to go and have a look at i'm currently um developing that and putting up some tutorials as we speak um that's it from me i'm going to stop talking somehow stop sharing my slides that's wonderful thank you Holly. that's fascinating work um, and Thank you. I, I do have lots and lots of questions, but we, uh, as it's a format with these sorts of webinars, we'll save them for the end of them, a bit of a chat there. Oh, um, good. It is great Thanks to see that much. work be, uh, being taken up as well by so many different jurisdictions. Um, okay, which Thank means you. that you're welcome. Uh, our next speaker is Ross Great. Ross, are you uh, happy to share your slides? Certainly, I'm Martin. Thanks very much. Lovely. Thank you. Seconds. We good? Okay, thanks, uh, thanks, Martin. Um, yep. So uh, my name's uh, Ross Crates. I'm a post. Ross, I might just interrupt for a second in that you're uh, you're sharing them on the screen. Oh uh, yeah. Um, if you could swap those around. Sorry. We good. Is that better? Perfect. Thank you. Excellent. All right. Thanks, Martin. Um, yeah, so I'm a postdoctoral re uh, research fellow at the ANU, um, and we work for the uh, Difficult Bird Research Group. Slightly tongue in cheek, but um, most of our work focuses on um, rare and highly mobile birds that are challenging to study. Um, none, none more so than the Regent Honeyeater. Regent Honeyeater, as many of you I'm sure will be aware, is a um, critically endangered um, songbird endemic to southeastern Australia. Um, used to be really common um, back in the good old days, less than 100 years ago, um, in suburban Melbourne. Um, but the population suffered really rapid decline um, to the point now where we think there may be fewer than 350 individuals left in the world um, in a range that still expands from northern Victoria up into southern Queensland. So our work is really kind of looking for needles in a haystack. But um, we've managed to find some birds over the last few years. And um, yeah, this talk's really going to summarise one of the most interesting components of what's come out of our research. Um, we weren't looking to study song in region honeyters in the slightest bit, but um, shortly after we started, we realised there's something pretty interesting going on. So um, this talk is just going to run you through what we've found so far. So song learning in birds, um, just to give you a sort of real quick rundown of what happens, very similar to learning humans, uh, language in humans, uh, generally occurs in a short time window when um, birds are juveniles. So between sort of, you know, like a one month and nine months to 12 months of life. Um, and birds learn their songs by associating with older experienced individuals um, that they hang around with in that, when they're young. Um, many birds, but not all birds, are, are what we call close-ended song learners. So by this, we mean that once they've gone through that period of, um, of learning, um, their songs are generally fixed by the time they're about a year old and they'll maintain that song for the rest of their lives. Um, and this is an example of an animal culture whereby um, behavioural norms are kind of maintained in a population through frequent interactions and information sharing between conspecifics that live together. 
So birdsong is really important. Um, two of the main reasons why it's important um, and why it exists in the first place is that it helps males to acquire and um, you know, maintain breeding territories. And it also it helps um, birds to um, you know, find and impress and acquire mates. So this video of a region I need to hear. This is a, um, a male in the in the lower Hunter Valley. Um, as you can see, they originally had to put a lot of effort into making not very much noise, um, which is quite an interesting component of their song. Um, anyway, just to briefly touch on um, the National Region Honeyton Monitoring Program. So um, this is what we established through the Difficult Bird Research Group in 2015. Um, one of the problems with Region Honeyters is that they're so rare and so sparsely distributed that Basically, the traditional monitoring program was not really um, yielding any useful data to help the, conserve the species anymore. Um, we know that region honeyters can travel, individual birds can travel hundreds of kilometers. Um, and the problem in terms of their movement is that we class them as nomadic. So they don't turn up in the same places um, in, the in the same like in consecutive years. And their movements are highly irregular in response to, you know, spatial temporal pat patterns in, in eucalypt blossom. Uh, their favourite species being yellow box and, and mugger iron bark. So um, this was a challenge that we had to overcome. Um, and in collaboration with, with BirdLife and uh, Laura Rayner, who was a postdoc in our group, we established a range-wide monitoring programme where we basically run around like headless chickens in um, between August and, and about December every spring. And we survey about 1,200 sites. Um, we look for region honeyters. One of the good things about region honeyters is that they tend to breed in these aggregations. So if we find one at a survey site, there's often a good chance that we'll find more birds in the area surrounding. So, so once we find them, we search the wider area. We can color band a sample of birds. We can monitor their nests. And importantly, we can record their songs because we found this amazing variation in songs of wild birds. Um, these these are these graphs here are what we call um, sonograms. So they're a visual uh, a visual way of um, depicting song in, in in birds. And so I'll um, I'll just go through some of these sonograms. So if you look at the, the the first column here that says species specific, this is what Regent honeyters in the wild used to sound like before the 1990s. And this is data that we um, we derive from the um, ALA. Let's play that again. The next one is a, a region honeyter from the Northern Tablelands in Northern New South Wales that I recorded in about 2018. The next one down here, see in the left column is a region honeyter from the Blue Mountains where most of the wild birds are persisting. And then we have what we call a clipped version. So these are birds occurring in the Blue Mountains that have lost a component of their song. So they still sound like a region honeyter, but they're, they're, their songs are kind of clipped. And then the bottom one here on the left is a, a captive bred region honeyter. So there's really drastic uh, variation in the songs of wild birds over space and time. Um, and that's within just within birds that we consider to still sing like a region honeyter. But what was really interesting is that we found a whole group of birds, you know, 18 when we published the paper and we're up to well over 25 now, of individuals that don't sound anything like a region honeyter at all um, and have learned the songs of other species. So this, the central column in this plot of sonograms, they're, they're still region honeyters, um, but the right hand column is actually other species whose songs they have learned from. So um, you should be able to see how similar um, in each row the middle and the right hand so, uh, graphs are in terms of how well that region hunters have learned to mimic these other species. So if we go through this, this, this figure here on the left gives you an idea of where we've uh, located region hunters. So every dot on the map is, is a region hunter. And the yellow dots um, depict the location of region honeyters that we found that sang like other species. 
um, and, the, and the species here represent the, the species that region honeys have learnt from. So I'll go through these. Um, just to recap, first of all, this is what most of the wild birds still sound like. Uh, this is a typical Blue Mountains song. So a bird that would occur, occur in this blue area west of Sydney should sound like this. Okay, if we go up and we listen to this uh, bird up here that had learnt to sing like a spiny cheeked honey eater. Uh, this one on the coast, number two, it sounds like a little wattle bird. This one here sounds like a noisy fry bird. So these are these are all these are all region honeyeaters. Um, just to recap, that have, have learned the songs of other species. These aren't these aren't the host species that you're hearing as we play these songs. Uh, this one here, a bird from the Cape Valley that sounded like a little fry bird. Um, one that absolutely blew my mind when we came across it down in um, Wollongong Botanic Gardens that sounded like a black-faced cuckoo shrike. <laughs> Chilton National Park, Pied Carawong, absolute epic. <laughs> and finally, one more noisy fryer bird for fun. So generally, they're pretty amazing um, impersonators of the, of the birds they've learned these songs from, but often, you know, they're not quite right. So you can kind of see that there's something a bit weird going on. Anyway, if we take all these songs and we, we map them and we take out different kind of components of the song sound metrics so things like um, amplitude frequency range um, song duration number of syllables and we plot these in multi-dimensional space we see that these different song types are really tightly clustered but separate in their own group so here the black dots represent the captive bread birds in Taronga Zoo the tight blue cluster on the bottom right here is the um, is the wild birds from the Blue Mountains then the lighter blue are the clipped Blue Mountain songs, which still sound like Blue Mountains that have lost a, a couple of syllables from their from their repertoire. Then the red circle is the Blue uh, Northern Tablelands birds, and the kind of peachy coloured one is the um, historical recordings that we got from the ALA. That give an indication of what region honeyeaters sounded like, you know, twenty or twenty odd years ago. Um, if we then map how these um, interspecific singers, so the, the yellow dots on, on the map that we showed you previously, if we look at um, population density, so if we take a snapshot of where all the birds were in space and time when we found them, what we find is that these birds that have learned to sing like other species have significantly fewer other uh, region honeyeaters around them at the time we find them. Whereas birds that still sing like a region honeyeater often more in the core of the range and, and have larger number of individuals nearby. I mean, still small in the grand scheme of things, but significantly more than most of these um, weird singing birds. So what we've also found is that the, the songs of region honeyeaters are, are becoming less complex over time. They're simplifying. So they're having they're, the, the songs are becoming shorter in duration. If we exclude here the uh, interspecific singers, but the species specific region honey to songs um, uh, are generally shorter and they generally have fewer syllables than the wild birds that were around in the 1990s. I'll just give you an example idea again. This is a recap of a, a, a pre 2012 Blue Mountain song. <laughs> 
then the clip blue mountain song and the captive bred bird song so one of the reasons why this is slightly worrying is that considering we know that bird song is really important for various things um, we were worried that it may actually be impacting um, fitness in in the region honeyeaters so um, what, what's going on with these birds that sing these weird songs? Are they struggling to impress females or, or, or what? Um, and what we found is that the birds that sounded like um, other species, so for example, um, the, the yellow bar in, in this middle column here, um, and birds that had a clipped blue mountain song, so the light blue, blue bar in this plot were less likely to be paired and less likely to nest than, than males that sounded like the typical blue mountain song. Um, and the plot here on the right, basically in the Mahalanobis distance is, an, is a measure of how different one particular male song is from the, the population norm. Um, and in the C plot, we, what we find is that as a male song becomes increasingly diff different from the cultural norm, like as in how most birds sound, their probability of being paired to a female decreases. So this is all a bit worrying. And what we think is happening basically is that where the population of region honeyeaters is becoming smaller and more sparsely distributed, we're finding that some young males are not actually able to locate other birds to learn their songs from um, when they're young and they leave the nest and move away from their parents. Um, and what's happening is that these birds, you know, in this critical song learning period between one month and eight months of life is they're actually just picking up the songs of random other birds they happen to associate with in the landscape at the time and that kind of we think explains why there's no rhyme or reason to the to the the birds that these other birds have learned from um why a black-faced cuckoo tribe or why a pied caramon um and it's very difficult to do anything about this in the wild because these birds are so highly mobile and when they leave the breeding grounds, we don't really know where they go still. So one of the only things we can do is try to um, help the captive bred birds to sing more like the wild birds. Um, this is current, current work ongoing. We have a PhD student, um, Daniel Appleby, who's working really closely with Taronga Zoo to basically try and give the, um, the captive juveniles um, some singing lessons using some experiments that involve playback tracks of the birds that we've recorded in the wild that still sing good songs. Um, and also in, in Mossman in Sydney, there's two birds that have been recruited to the um, captive breeding population that have good classic wild songs. And so we're, we're comparing the um, success of these two kind of lesson techniques, one being playback, one being live tutors, um to how that improves the song of the um the, the captive juvenile males just uh to a young young male here still got some This, this guy is still in the process of learning his song, but what we're hoping is within a, another few months, we'll have an idea of whether it's worked or not. So I'll leave it there. Um, there's a link to our website where you can access all the papers under the research output. Um, and just, yeah, thanks to many people that have helped make this work possible. Um, the ALA for providing the, the historical songs, um, BirdLife Australia for helping the field, um, the traditional custodians of the country, um, yeah. Many, uh, many peoples across the whole of southeastern Australia and um, yeah, heaps of people that have donated and contributed to the work. So thanks very much. Thanks, Ross. That was genuinely a fantastic talk. Like um, that mimicry is, is incredible. I'm not an ornithologist, but it was really recognisable what species they were mimicking. Yeah, it's really fascinating. All right. Well, not to give Julia a hard time, but uh, Pressure. Is, is Julia. Yeah, absolutely. You, um, you'll kill it. It'll be totally. <laughs> um, yeah, looking forward to hearing, hearing what, uh, what Julie's got to say. Thanks. Thanks, Thanks for that. Ron. Okay. <clears throat> okay, just make sure you can see my screen and hear me okay? Yeah, that's perfect. Yeah, Thank good. You.
Great, well thanks and yeah, it is a bit of a um, nerve wracking to go after two awesome talks, but um, hopefully the, the sort of scale of mine will do it some justice. Um, so this is some research that I did during my PhD. Um, I worked on the EMU during my PhD and I'm actually one of the few people who've, who've worked on the EMU. They're notoriously hard to study, you know, they're, they're a really large size, so they're difficult to catch and track. Um, they, can, they can travel enormous distances. So we actually don't know much about um, emus in the wild. And most of our studies on emus have actually been on farmed um, birds. So there's a lot of things we don't know about them and a lot of things we don't understand about um, their interactions in the wild. We do know that they can travel enormous distances, so up to 500 kilometres in a year, particularly in the west where they um, travel in response to rainfall patterns. Uh, in, the, in the east of Australia, they're a little bit more residential, so they'll sort of stay in an area, but they're, they're not territorial. Um, they'll often pair for the year, but they're not monogamous. They'll um, you know, mate with sort of several different partners. Um, and sort of anecdotally, there's been lots of reports that they're sort of disappearing across the east coast, so east of the divide, Great Dividing Range, but we're not really quite sure why. Um, this was some data from the Bird Atlas, which looked, I think it was 10 or 20 years apart, um, areas where there was increase or decrease um, in, in different bird species. This is for the emu, and it's a bit tricky to see because it's a scanned copy, but um, most of that sort of hatched area across Australia, um, there was a greater than a 20% decline. And so we've got kind of four stronghold populations um, in New South Wales across the east coast. These three bottom ones here are all introduced and our last sort of endemic um, stronghold population is up in Urigir National Park. So there's a coastal emu population. Um, that's actually listed as a threatened population and endangered population here in New South Wales. Um, but just for this talk, I'm just going to you know, refer to these ones and just have a bit, bit of a talk about these two populations. So some amazing um, data has been collected and it's, it's difficult, even though they're really large in size, you often can't see them when they're in low densities. Um, but in both populations, there's been a decline, particularly in the sub-adult um, population. So chicks aren't making it through to sub-adulthood. We don't really know how long um, emus live in the wild, but probably 15 to 20 years. So this might not quite capture um, em uh, the adult decline. And when we do look at some, um, a bit of a longer time span, you can see that one of the populations does have um, the adult population declining. We're not really sure why this is. This is. Um, there's probably this low reproductive success might be to do with urbanisation pressures, um, predation by foxes uh, on the nest and of chicks and destruction of nests um, and, and adults and sub-adults getting entangled in fences or hit on the road. Um, and another idea that sort of has been thrown about a little bit is that there's been shifts in environment and climate, um, obviously in terms of that available habitat across the East Coast, but also in terms of the climate across the East Coast. And this was something that we were sort of keen to have a look at so we, you know, it's really difficult to track emus. So we used some presence data, uh, which we were really lucky to have an enormous data set from Atlas of Living Australia. So the, the time there was just over 80,000 records of emus. They're obviously pretty easy to recognise. So um, you can be pretty confident in those presences. The tricky thing, and this might be a little bit dry for some, but um, something to think about for others who are using this data is it's an enormous and amazing data set that no one person could collect. It also has some, you know, some issues in that people often don't record absences and presences are more likely to be recorded in areas where there's lots of people and lots of people moving through. So when we were using this data, we had to think about how to try to reduce that bias um, and create absences um, in a way that kind of represented the same kind of biases. So we used this method called surrogate species presences, which essentially we looked at a whole lot of different um, common birds that are across the whole of Australia and looked at how uh, commonly that they were recorded in ALA in different areas and sort of used that to say, okay, these are the areas where there's really biased, um, you know, lots of recordings. And so making our kind of absences in the same way. It's a little bit complicated, but it's, yeah, it's something important to think about when you're doing this kind of, this kind of modeling. Um, we then used a range of different models, which we, we created sort of a consensus model. Um, and we did this for the whole of Australia and then just for along the Great Dividing Range. 
Um, and what we then did is paired this with some climate and habitat data that's sort of publicly available and looked at what predicted for emu occurrence. Um, and then we projected this for our current climate, what we're, where we're likely to see them today. We predicted it for our past climate, so where they were likely to be sort of around 6,000 years ago and then into the future where they're likely to be um, under a climate change scenario in, in the next 70 years. And so we had a lot of different predictors in there of habitat types, but what we really always found was that climate really strongly predicts for emu distribution. So, you know, they're a generalist, they're not too worried about different habitat types, they can find plenty of resources, but they are really strongly driven by particularly um, uh, rainfall patterns and they like areas that have fairly um, consistent rainfall across the year. So this meant that we could just look at the climate and we could predict into what our, our current climate, our past climate and our future climate where emus were likely to occur. Um, and you can see that in our past climate where we've got this sort of bright yellow at the bottom, that's where they were really highly likely to occur. Um, and you know, there's lots of areas along the east coast where they were really likely to occur, but, but not so much into the central and northern parts of Australia. Um, and, and in the past 6,000 years, it looks like the distribution has actually expanded throughout the central parts um, of Australia, uh, northward, but retracted across the east coast. And you've got these sort of patches now where there's really low likelihood of occurrence. Um, and so non-suitable climate across those east coast regions. What's, what's really good from this is that we can see that the distribution is probably not going to change much under our climate change scenario. Um, and the one we used was essentially a no emissions reduction, so a bit of a worst case scenario. Um, and they, they, their distribution looks fairly stable. And this is just essentially, again, showing the same thing. So you've got these areas um, in bright yellow that you've had this, uh, this big gain and in dark blue, you've had a loss. So there's been a big, big um, expansion of their range in central Australia, but a reduction along the east coast. Um, so, you know, this is really interesting sort of just to think about the history of how emus have moved across the landscape, uh, where they were in the, in the past and, and where they're likely to be in the future. But what does this mean for when we're, you know, managing individual populations and how can this sort of modelling help us, you know, in a practical sense, which is what I was really um, hoping to gain out of it. Uh, and so we sort of have a little few little case studies of the ways that we can use this sort of research um, at a much more small scale and practical application. Um, so again, my two little populations here along the east coast. So this is uh, out in the west of Sydney. It's actually quite in the suburbs, but it's um, a sort of 600 hectare uh, regional park that is in, um, is is not open to the public. So emus are quite safe in there, but they were introduced, um, emus would have been in the area historically, um, but you know, they, they've disappeared out of the Sydney region, except for this one introduced population, which we're looking at managing now. Um, and you can see it's actually right uh, at the edge of where there's suitable climate for emus now. So it's a bit of a, um, it's, it's a bit of an uphill battle then to be able to manage this kind of population where they've, uh, then there is an optimal climate for them, which could, we you know, we can't kind of from this modelling know exactly how that affects um, reproductive success, the, the quality of their food. Um, we can just sort of say that, you know, there are, it is suboptimal climate and that probably has an impact on, on these other sort of things. And this is our little second population, um, our endemic population that's listed in New South Wales, right up on the north coast. Um, there's lots of ideas about why this population has uh, declined. Um, there's a lot of agricultural areas that you know might be contributing to poor reproductive success with eggs getting um, destroyed by, by predators and by farming practices. Um, but one really interesting thing that came out of this was that um, it's a little difficult to see in our Australia wide map, but when you have the little cropped version, they are right in a little pocket, um, a sort of climatically isolated pocket up in the north coast that's suitable for them. Um, and when you look at the red records up here on the right, you can see they pretty neatly fit into this area in yellow, which is their sort of highly suitable climate. So they're a little bit of a climate um, refugee out here um, in isolation, um, which 
you know, is make does make obviously managing the population difficult. But one thing that's really important with this population is that we found um, through some other work that they're genetically distinct, um, and so they could represent, you know, um, genes that could assist in um, adaptation to climate change. Uh, and so conserving this population is is really important. Our second little case study was um, actually run by Tristan Durham down in the University of Tassie. So Tristan contacted me early in my PhD and he was really interested in um, Tassie emus that became extinct in Tassie in around in the early 1900s. Um, they were hunted to extinction. And Tristan was particularly interested in sort of the ecology and philosophy behind rewilding um, and, and had started to think about, you know, the, the ideas around rewilding of Tassie emus, um, which were the same species as mainland emus. Um, and so we started talking about, you know, where there would be suitable climate and habitat, you know, today and whether whether there would be any suitable um, climate and habitat. And so Tristan did a fair bit of work trying to collate all historic records um, from not just ALA, but from also other sort of early settler diaries um, and sort of built a model of where they were likely to be in Tassie before they were hunted to extinction. And so you can see they were sort of pretty prevalent right down the centre of Tassie um, and to the sort of east of Tassie. And so what we could do with our models that we that I created for the mainland was we could say, well, today, where is there suitable climate for emus and where, where are these, you know, potentials for um, reintroduction if that was, you know, something that, you know, hypothetically you would, you would go ahead and do. And so we projected those um, mainland models onto Tassie and you can see it actually gives you pretty similar results. So in the past, again, right down the centre was really highly like high, um, high suitable climate um, and same with our current and actually a little bit of an expansion into the future. So the areas of suitable um, habitat and climate haven't actually significantly declined in Tassie, which is really interesting. Um, Tristan actually went on to go and do some additional um, work on this which was really really interesting and he looked at you know we have to think about there's a lot of obviously a lot of considerations with something like rewilding um, but the, in the most simplest form just looking at we've got these areas where we know there's suitable climate but are these areas also safe um, for emus um, in terms of you know if there's going to be human um, animal conflicts on farms and so looked at areas of safe sort of refuge um, in conservation areas and then areas of incompatible land use so things like farms and roads um, and then it could make a sort of map based on all of these variables of areas that uh, could be potential reintroduction um, introduction spots so we have to watch this space a little bit longer um, well, we're getting that paper out but that's another really interesting way that we were able to use this in a bit more of a practical sense uh, so I'll leave you there just yeah thank you to everyone for coming today um, and listening to our talks um, and thank you to my funding bodies um, and any questions just get in contact happy to answer that's wonderful thank you Julia um, my goodness it's amazing what people are doing these days it's fascinating talks from all three of you and um, if you were looking as I am on another screen at all the questions we've got you would be somewhat intimidated at the number we're going to get through in about 10 minutes um, we're not going to be able to get through all of them I'm afraid I, I might just ask a couple at first and we can and, uh, extrapolate from there um, someone asked a, a very interesting question very early on about Holly's talk actually which was um, it seems like your approach there Holly was based on some really robust um, ecological principles um, and th there was a question about uh, is it um, is there then some data to like to validate them in that context like is it possible to look at animals and see that they're making those movements and those sorts of things yeah so um, oh I'm not I'm not on mute I, I was like I'm on mute no I'm not um, uh, yeah so what would be this is a really great question and one of the things that um, myself and some of my colleagues are pretty keen to be doing is actually, um, you know, we base a lot of our planning assumptions in urban spaces on information that we derive from outside urban spaces. Um, and what we're starting to realize is that the way animals behave in urban environments is often quite different um, and possibly a little harder to predict. 
and um, not always some of it's kind of kind of intuitive so um a year or so ago i did some work trying to sort of just ascertain whether the distribution of sort of common urban birds that we see in um in cities are uh, would match uh, with that that we might expect from um the kind of distance um dispersal models that we know these birds are capable of um, and it does look um just this is work that i haven't had time to analyze yet but it does look like a lot of our kind of common urban birds particularly so um these are things that are not highly urban adapted so we're not talking about things like rainbow lorikeets noisy miners or red wattle birds we're talking about those smaller um, birds bush birds things like superb fairy wrens or some of our smaller honey eaters that uh, do occur in parks but probably use parks as a sort of stronghold um, and it does look like they are not as capable of moving the kinds of distances that we would expect them to move across or between patches um, so a lot of the models um, and work I didn't present today, um, but we actually spent some time testing the sensitivity of the connectivity metric that we're using to different dispersal distances, um, because we were aware that that was kind of a big assumption that we're making. And then obviously the why this sort of the superb city rens project came about is to do with trying to test some of that um, understanding so we will be individually color marking um superb fairy wrens in the city of melbourne to see if we start to see them um moving beyond the boundaries of their current stronghold which is royal park yeah thanks holly that, that's really fascinating yeah. work and i'm sure it's the case with, with most of you there's a lot that you didn't present uh, <laughs> how could you um one thing that each of you spoke about was um was not just treating these species as just something you study in isolation but the fact that they live in in human modified landscapes right now that we share these landscapes with these species um we've had a few questions about the the bushfires particularly for ross and julia that um, you could add urbanization or land clearing or climate change those things as well how much um is that a, a feature of your work and how much does um I suppose it's an open question. And uh, how much does that um, provide challenges and, and opportunities in your research, do you think? I don't mind if Ross or Julie gives that a go first. first. I, I, <laughs> yeah. Um, Regent honeyters are a, um, a classic one that because you know most most protected most protected land or you know most land that's designated for conservation is land that is um, unproductive and generally unsuitable for agriculture. So there's this whole suite of threatened woodland birds that are threatened exactly because they, you know, they live in, in woodlands or, you know, habitat types that require productive soils, you know, things like the, your box ironbark woodlands and riparian zones. And region honey is a prime example of that. And so even though we do find um, region honey eaters um, in some national parks, um, particularly sort of around the Cape Sea area, a lot of the areas we find these birds, and even as as we speak now, we've got colleagues out monitoring nests on on, on farms. Um, and so, it's an it's an interesting one because um, you know often if if private landowners, um, you know, there's region hunters on their land, it means that generally by definition they're kind of um, you know. View, view conservation favorably because if they didn't their habitat wouldn't even be there in the first place it would already have been cleared so um, generally speaking um, you know private land conservation is not not too much of an issue for for region honey eaters but it would be nice if um, you know if governments or decision makers in future could consider instead of acquiring you know large amounts of land um, often on sort of hilltops and ridge lines um, that already can serve a large amount of what we've, you know, is already conserved, that they would consider maybe um, focusing towards more on low, low lying vegetation communities that would be more expensive um, to acquire and manage, but that would capture that kind of um, proportion of the, of the threatened woodland species that um, aren't really kind of um, well, well conserved within national parks at the moment. Yeah, thanks, Ross. It's, a, it's an interesting point, isn't it? That I, I think I um, read a statistic somewhere that 50% of Australia is farmland, for example. Like to to ignore it is, is it would be a strange act. Um, 
Julia, look, we've had questions specifically about emus and things like fire, and someone mentioned recent mouse plagues as well. I mean, are th these aren't necessarily what you'd call emerging threats, but they're not necessarily ones you can predict either. Is there a um, is there a challenge there in studying a species that's very widespread and, and therefore affected by so many different threats? Yeah, and I think um, when because I am modelling it at such a large scale, it does tend to kind of wash out all of those, um, I guess, other factors a little bit. Um, you know, I did add fire into the model, so fire frequency into the model about whether that predicts, but. I guess the difficulty is they occur across such an enormous amount of area, those sort of fine scale things don't often come out as important. Um, whereas where you have big changes in, in rainfall across an entire continent, that comes out as something that's really important. So, but I think at a population level, um, it is really important. I think the difficulty is that we often don't have the before information. So we'll often have information about what's happening in the population after and speculate about what the fire might have, have had. So for example, um, a lot of the fires happened right when the chicks were emerging for emus. So undoubtedly it had an impact, but um, we, ha we have no data for most sort of population. And then it would be the same for most animal species. We don't have that before information to really understand how that actually implicated um, that population. So at a fine scale, I think there's a lot of that sort of, those sort of factors that we don't, we don't really know. Yeah, it is so challenging, isn't it? So many species in such a large area to, to have the information you need. Um, going back to you, Holly, there was a there was a question someone asked in the chat about um, because of course your work is is not just um, treating a human environment as, as an afterthought; it's central to it, and the planning aspect is central. Um, to what extent um, was the question that came through? Is is it possible to um, to retrofit some of these ideas? Is is it are we talking entirely about new builds, or is it possible to improve the biodiversity of existing? Yeah, species? no, um, not at all. So, um, actually, one of the big projects again that I didn't sort of alluded to, but didn't touch on that um, we were really lucky to work on recently was the Fisherman's Bend renewal in the city of Melbourne, which is is absolutely not a new greenfield um, development. It is an old kind of industrial, partially industrial or commercial area and a lot of new, uh, a lot of um, old residential areas that's undergoing total renewal over the next kind of 50 years. Um, very large, um, very large development. So we use something called the Biodiversity Sensitive Urban Design Framework. Um, at Fisherman's Bend to try and really prioritise biodiversity at the beginning of that project. So um, we were we worked alongside quite a few um, local government organisations, state governments, and um, a whole raft of urban planners and landscape architects who are in, involved at various levels of that to come up with a bit of a sort of set of really robust recommendations for Fisherman's Bend. Um, now that work, this is, I'm learning a lot, I've learned a lot in the last year about how urban planning works and the different stages at which we need to act within the urban planning process. So at the moment we set out, I think we had four very fundamental recommendations for Fisherman's Bend that are overarching, things to do with um, retaining existing vegetation as much as possible, um, planning for threats within the environment, so um, to do with so that's to do with like mitigating um, the conflict with traffic, but also things like pesticides and pet containment. Um, and then we had very kind of selective design implications, which were kind of more spatial. So please, can we put in a kind of green walkway here, that kind of thing that will link up these parklands or prospective parklands. Um, and that's now gone into this sort of um, planning stage, which is, run by the state government where they create, um, they're called precinct structure plans, um, and some of those recommendations will be laid down in there, but there's still a lot more work to do with the developers as they come on side in, in Fisherman's Bend. So that is absolutely, we can retrofit and we can make our urban spaces better, um, and we can also consider um, making the new urban spaces better as well. Yeah, thanks. That's it's actually really inspiring to know that people are working on these problems and, and, and coming together from different fields as well. 
to, to make that sort of progress. Um, I'd love to keep asking questions, but we're on the hour now and I'm aware we're out of time. So um, to all the viewers out there, thank you for tuning in. Uh, I'm very sorry if we didn't get to ask your questions. Um, just too, too many interesting things to talk about and we'll be doing another one of these in another couple of months. So please, uh, yeah, look out for that in your inbox and then tune in again. But for now, thank you everyone for, for speaking. There's some amazing talks and uh, we're having a really great time. Thank you. Goodbye.